This video will contain discussions of sexual assault, violence, homophobia, British people, transphobia, and racism. Proceed with this in mind. In the last month or two, the online queer community has been swept up in an obsession with two shows, Our Flag Means Death and Heartstopper. I recently watched both. I took about two days to get through each of them, and I have so many thoughts. A lot of what I have to say, however, is better covered by Cecilia is Gray on TikTok and Rowan Ellis here on YouTube. But something I haven't seen addressed a lot is how Heartstopper in particular portrays bigotry. It's a little bit of a non-factor in Our Flag Means Death because that show is pretty much exclusively focused on queer joy, which is a beautiful thing. But in Heartstopper, the bigotry is inseparable from the main plot. As you can probably tell, there will be spoilers for Heartstopper in this video. Go watch it. It is only four hours long. It is located on Netflix. You can watch it. Go do it. Part 1. General Review So what is Heartstopper? It originated as a webcomic, written by the English queer writer Alice Oseman, who also serves as a writer, creator, and executive producer on the series. The webcomic, as far as I can tell, follows about the same plot as the series, and comic fans seem pretty happy with the adaptation as far as tone and general plot go. I haven't read it, but I plan to, and... It has a fandom for a reason. The show is so good. It doesn't shy away from depicting the difficult parts of being queer. The first episode shows a sexual assault and homophobia is present throughout. It is not something to go into if you're not in a decently stable state of mind, but if you are, it is absolutely worth the time spent on it. The portrayal of queer joy is one of my favorite things that I have ever seen. I'm not going to give a full synopsis, partially because I want you to watch it. It's a good, fun show that has no shame about being openly and explicitly queer, but it still portrays the ugliness that can come with being openly queer in a modern-day high school. It is very firmly rooted in the present day, and it uses things like Instagram, contemporary music, and other cultural touchstones to ensure that it will age like fine wine as a time capsule of the pre-pandemic culture in which it was written. There is a largely authentic cast who all deliver really good performances, and the score is good. It is strangely sapphic heavy for a show so largely focused on multi-level man love, but... It deals with lesbian relationships as well as gay ones, and it takes the time that it needs to tell its story with tact and honesty. It's already been renewed for seasons two and three, and it is obvious how much the cast enjoys their jobs. It's an honest portrayal of being a queer teenager, and I'm about to analyze it, so once again, go watch it before you carry on to the next part. Part two, homophobia. There are several types of bigotry in this show, but by far the most prevalent is homophobia. The show begins with Charlie, our main character, in an abusive relationship. He is being hidden away by Ben, a closeted bisexual boy who is using Charlie to provide an outlet for his queer feelings while keeping him hidden to stay safe and maintain his image as a straight man at school. He's even dating a girl at school without Charlie knowing. The first episode climaxes with Ben assaulting Charlie and being pulled off by the assumedly straight Nick. This is certainly not the most extreme form of direct homophobia that we see, and it may not even register as such, but the desire to hide a queer relationship, not because of your safety, but more so because you feel ashamed of it, is a very intense form of internalized homophobia. Internalized homophobia remains present throughout the show as we follow Nick, Tara, and to a lesser extent Ben's coming out journeys. We are allowed into their lives enough to see the fear and internalized feelings that they are all working through. 
The main force of homophobia throughout the show is Nick's rugby friends. There is constant tension between the person they expect him to be and who he truly is. They are forcing him into the uber-violent world of toxic masculinity that he doesn't fit into. Harry, in particular, seems to be the ringleader of this, constantly making fun of Charlie for being gay, poking fun at his effeminate mannerisms and stereotypical behavior. Even if the rest of the group doesn't 100% share those feelings, they are not willing to stand up to the most popular, biggest, and strongest of the bunch. Nick doesn't feel like he is safe to come out or even explore, and searches in the dark for answers that the internet can't fully give him. In the end, Nick manages to stand up to his friends, and although no true change occurs for them, it may have been able to plant a seed of doubt in them, leading to change further down the line. The show is very focused on a man-loves-marketing relationship, but there is lesbophobia, mostly centered around Elle's two new friends. Elle is a trans girl who recently switched from the boys' school to the girls' school. Darcy has been out for a long time, and is kinda used to the casual lesbophobia of straight girls. Tara, on the other hand, comes out during the course of the show, and is instantly exposed to the full force of that bigotry. The snide glances, the teasing and bullying, everything that comes along with being out in a high school. This too is treated with tact and sensitivity, leading to a full breakdown that is given the space to breathe despite the overwhelming focus of man-level marketing that the show has as a whole. Overall, the homophobia is very present, but it is delicately and tactfully treated. Part 3. The Source of the Bigotry This is a pretty short section, but it's important, so here we go. Of all the bigotry I mentioned, you probably noticed that it all came from the main character's peers or friends. And that's because there's just no bigotry coming from adults. No one in a position of power is ever portrayed as anything less than completely accepting of their queerness. This may seem like a small thing, but considering that the audience of this show is primarily younger queer children, it's so important that they portray authority characters in this way. Throughout the show, Mr. Ajayi, a queer black teacher at the school, is shown as a constant pillar of support in Charlie's life pushing him to grow as a person while still giving him as much space as he needs to process what is happening in a safe place away from the judgment of his peers and family. In episode 8, Nick comes out to his mother, played by Olivia Coleman, and that scene is incredibly well handled. You can feel Nick's doubt, his fear of rejection, while you, as the viewer, are never doubting that he will be met with love and acceptance. It is never really a question that these characters will, ultimately, have safe spaces with their loved ones, and that some of those loved ones will be adults with real power in the world on a level that teenagers just don't have. Part 4. Neglected Portrayals I've been very positive so far, and overall, I very much am. I think this show does a very, very good job of portraying the realities of being a white, cisgender, queer teenager in high school around the present day. If you noticed a few caveats there, it's because, yeah, I, I have a few critiques. Most of these center around the character of Elle. She is a transgender woman of color, portrayed by Yasmin Finney, who recently switched schools due to the gender segregation of the two schools featured in the show. There are allusions to bullying in the form of transphobia that eventually drove her to make that switch, but it is in no way a focus of the show. It's a thing of the past. The elements of misogyny that are inherent in most homophobia are shown. The rugby boys call Charlie girly, but misogyny itself is hardly mentioned. Racism is never portrayed at all, despite three of the main characters being people of color. Tao is Asian, and Ellen Tara are both black. Now, I'm not saying that in order to be good or woke, the show must portray every bit of bigotry under the sun, and I realize that it is possible, maybe even likely, 
that these concerns are null and void when you have read the webcomic. But in the show as a self-contained piece of art, it stands out to me that homophobia gets such intense, realistic portrayal while nearly every other type of bigotry is relegated to a background detail or a thing of the past, if it's present at all. I appreciate that Alice Oseman is white, like myself, and may have felt unqualified to discuss racism, which is fair. I would urge them to hire people of color, particularly black people, to write about that subject. The bigotry faced by people of color, especially women of color, and trans people of color, is fundamentally different from that faced by white people of any gender or sexual orientation. You cannot take the homophobia faced by people of color and separate it from the racism they face. Particularly in Britain, bigotry presents itself in a very sinister way. British society is ruled by etiquette, by rules. The members of Parliament have very strict rules as to how they are allowed to talk about each other. Things like openly calling out racism are rarely allowed and never without a warning. This makes the bigotry even more dangerous than it otherwise would have been. It is unable to be properly called out or warned against. It is folded into other bigotries in a sinister way. Intersectionality is the only way to fully explore the impact that bigotry will have on that person. If the goal of the show is to portray a realistic but hopeful view of what it is like to exist as a queer teenager in the present day, which is something it seems to be attempting, it is irresponsible to ignore the intersections between racism and homophobia. I don't want the hopeful themes or overall tone of the show to be altered too much, as I feel it's important to show young queer people, especially people of color, that there is hope. But some exploration of the intersectionality inherent in bigotry would be nice. I'm told that the webcomic has explored some of these, and I sincerely hope that the following seasons of this show can do the same, ideally by inviting more trans people and people of color on as writers. Part 5. Conclusion. Heartstopper is really good. The portrayal of homophobia is realistic and tactful while maintaining an overall hopeful tone. The narrative is overwhelmingly about queer joy, but does not shy away from the hard parts of being queer. If you are a young queer or even an older LGBTQ plus person who still remembers high school, I highly recommend it. It is heavy at times, but overall a good time and will make you go aww over and over again. My criticisms are easily fixable for the future and have more to do with stuff that was left out rather than anything that was included that was bad. As I said at the start, anything else that I have to say has been better said elsewhere. I would love to be able to pay the people of color who gave input on the section about racism for their labor, and as such I've started a Patreon. If anyone subscribes, you'll get extra videos and maybe even early access and blooper reels, you know. There's no pressure, just like there's no pressure to do any of the other YouTube things. Just thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.